can you introduce dr mayra <laughs> dr rajasri i'm happy to introduce myself <laughs> rajis yeah raji you there uh, yes ma'am yeah 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 shall i yes me of course me. hello <laughs> Oh, uh, Moira, Dr. Moira Lang, she is a lead, leading palliative care physician and she, she is taking the lead in two countries like Uganda and in Scotland and she is so instrumental in developing capacity, I mean the curriculum uh, and in developing newer models for the developing countries and also she is so interested in, uh, you know, like uh, uh, mentorship and capacity building. And more than that, I would like to introduce her like our always all time best friend uh, to develop any new protocol or guidelines. And she has been uh, the brain behind our pallet. Thank um, you. Before fundraising it, you know, uh, she had all the wonderful inputs. And welcome, Mora. And Thank you so much, Raji, and thank you for those very kind comments. I've been privileged to work and learn from uh, my colleagues in Kerala since 99, and I've been a palliative care physician and internal medicine trained for the last around 30 years. So I'm still learning, but I hopefully I'll bring some of that experience today. But I really very much want us to focus on the question in hand, which is the triage. The triage issues, I think, is causing some of the most um, concern in our general population, in our healthcare population. Uh, the ethical issues around it are really quite heartrending at times. And I've heard colleagues from Italy, uh, colleagues from uh, other places in Europe and China speak about this. So let's have a good discussion. But I want us to be a little interactive, even though we are online. So you can see the screen in front of you. Can I ask you, as we set the scene, as we discuss, can you straight away, if you haven't done it before, download the ebook? You can see the link on screen. Please uh, copy and paste that link if it doesn't hyperlink for you into your, your browsers for two reasons. One, this is the core document that we're teaching on in this course. Uh, and it's been uh, an amazing development uh, by uh, colleagues in Kerala um, uh, over the last two weeks and it will be continually updated. So please straight away do that as I'm talking. And then for those of you who don't have the PaliCare app, uh, this is a very good uh, general palliative care application that's free on Android or Apple, Apple devices that was developed in Bangalore. And that's where I think we should go for our general palliative care advice if you don't have it in your local setting. And uh, the ebook is where we're going to focus in these echo sessions. Now, in the ebook are algorithms, key algorithms for symptom control and also for um, ethical and psychosocial. Uh, decision making. So we're going to look at those algorithms today. They may or may not show brilliantly on screen. So if you have downloaded this, you can do it. Now I think somebody is adding, if you haven't, can someone add this link to the chat box so anyone who comes on later can download. Thank you so much. So let's set the scene. I'm going to set the scene a little more quickly because I think this is familiar territory uh, and that's around the general principles of ethics and I will attempt to apply those into the setting in, in uh, COVID-19. But then we'll focus more on looking at the two algorithms on triage and goals of care. And a reminder that these were written for frontline staff. They weren't predominantly written for intensivists. Um, there are other guidelines for intensivists, but this is for those of us who are trying to decide whether or not we need to escalate and refer on to intensivists. And of course, I'm hoping we'll have plenty of time for uh, input and discussion. So setting the scene, we know that ethical issues are something to do with our moral principles that apply values as well as judgments to our practice. And they have the clinical role that we're familiar with, 
but of course they have these other uh, backgrounds and understanding and frameworks. We're just going to mention one of the frameworks, the common one for clinical settings, but do remember when we're looking at ethics, they are set within this wider dimension. I think even if I'd asked you, you could have told me these four. So we know these four pillars, looking at autonomy, beneficence, non-maleficence, and justice. And I'm going to take each of these. If you are very familiar, please concentrate on downloading your ebook and finding your algorithms as I just take you through something that is a little familiar for many of you. So autonomy, autonomy, patient choice, and control over decisions. This is something we all adhere to, whether we're in palliative care or not. Um, but we also realize this particular principle has quite cultural contexts. And we have to look at what are the cultural contexts that might be relevant. For example, in a collectivist society, people may choose to allow their autonomy to be influenced by others, particularly family members. We have to be careful that doesn't become paternalism or collusion, where we are coercing people to make decisions. But it's important to remember that. Let me remind you of some of these concepts that have been written. This is one from Africa. I'm sitting in Uganda just now. This concept of Ubuntu, which is talking about we are because of I am. So the individual is part of society and the group. Bishop Desmond Tutu has described this. My humanity is caught up, inextricably bound up in what is yours. And I had the privilege of visiting uh, people from the Kuki community in Manipur last year, and they had a very similar concept called Kanko. So let us think of the culture and collective environment in which we still believe very strongly that a person who has questions about their illness should be given the opportunity to ask those questions, to have truthful and honest answers, and to be involved in their decision making. Perhaps this is the principle we're most familiar with, beneficence, doing good. If I were to ask you why you came into healthcare, I think this would be uh, key for many of you. We want to do the best for our patients and we want to do that uh, with confidentiality, but avoiding futile care. And I'm going to come on to futile care. Of course, in this context, we're challenged because this is a new illness and sometimes we don't know what is the best clinical decision and we're having to work fast with our colleagues uh, to work to to get the evidence to back up our clinical decisions non-maleficence if we want to do good we should not do harm information and truth giving i've said is important but that should not be done in an insensitive way we definitely should not uh, treat a person like a machine where we simply look at numbers and oxygen levels and we forget the person and their context. We forget their wishes, their longings, their dreams, their need for communication and support. And we have to consider whether withdrawing or withholding treatment is actually avoiding harm. And I'm very pleased in our triage documents, we've got away from using words like life-sustaining and more thought about appropriate interventions, because many of us are aware that some of the high-tech interventions are not life-sustaining. They may even diminish the quality of life. Of course, for some, they can be very important. Remember too in this one that we should not be causing social or financial harm, not just medical and clinical harm. And then, of course, the principle of justice. This is the principle that is causing a lot of concern right now. Are we going to have to somehow uh, meet out resources to those that we deem or we decide are going to most benefit? A kind of utilitarian approach. And where does concern for the individual and their choice come into the allocation of resources? I'll just say here that for those of us working in low and middle income settings, this is our day to day experience. Not everyone can access every healthcare option. And of course, we feel very strongly that we should be seeking for the best treatment for all. And we have worked very hard uh, 
Professor Raj Gopal, of course, leads the WHO Collaborating Center looking at access to essential medications. We have colleagues from the WHO on this call. We should be advocating for the best health care, for universal health care. And can I take a moment to thank Kerala State for what they have done to contribute towards this and this epidemic. But we do have to make these clinical decisions based on the available resources for that particular individual and family and for the setting in which they are in. Just a reminder about futility. If an intervention is going to cause harm and no benefit, and that's, that's a, a, a balance we need to think through with our colleagues and with patients and their families, then we are not obligated to deliver that. And that's an important thing to remember. We have, of course, legal frameworks, but ethical frameworks, we are not obligated to do an intervention that we don't think, according to a consensus decision, is going to be of benefit. Okay, so these ethical principles, they guide us. They're particularly relevant in these end of life or acute uh, settings. They shouldn't be culturally dependent, but they do have a context that I've talked about, and they're not laws. So we have to look at the ethical frameworks, of course, in the legal settings that we're working. I'm not going to say too much about the legal settings in India, because I want to set the scene here. If that comes up in questions, we have many people on this call who can speak to this. But we used to have consensus statements to help us with some of these decisions, particularly on withdrawal of treatments. And this was a very important paper um, jointly with colleagues in the critical care world that helped us. We now do have um, Supreme Court judgments and we do have uh, guidelines that help us roll these out. And I mentioned two here, one from Ames in Delhi and the other from, um, from Manipal. Uh, I think it is still early days to know exactly how this rolls out in practice and colleagues from across India on this call may want to comment on the legal issues in their settings. But it's important to remember that this is about end of life care with dignity and we shouldn't be confusing the term euthanasia, which has been unfortunately confused. And that means a deliberate ending of life. What we are talking about here is are these interventions going to be of benefit? If they are, let's make sure people have the right to those interventions as much as we can manage it. If they're not going to be of benefit, how do we have those conversations and make those decisions? And I think I've mentioned benefits and burdens, so I won't perhaps labor that anymore. But there is a dilemma sometimes for us when we feel they're in conflict, when a patient our family want one thing, but clinically, we think another thing. And the answer to that is usually not a legalistic approach, although we have to have our frameworks. The answer to that is usually open and effective communication with clear uh, guidelines and backup for us as we seek to have these conversations. Try and see yourself as on the same side as your patient and family. We all want what is best for our patients. I know that. How we communicate that is, of course, the skill that we, we're going to look at even more on an echo session tomorrow and Dr. Bijou looked at yesterday. But we need to make them in the perspective of our patient and our wider society. And thank you to all healthcare workers like this one in the picture in India who are operating at the front line in very difficult circumstances. We have some particularly ethical issues here. We have very vulnerable patients and families with a disease progression, which can be extremely rapid for some. There is a sense of fear and desperation. There's inequality, not just across country or state settings, but even within states where those who are poorer, those who live in crowded accommodation, those with a pre-existing chronic disease, even some uh, particularly minority or tribal groups will not have the same access. And we are seeing increasing stigma and fear, uh, perhaps the unexpectedness of this pandemic, the infectious nature, and I'm also hearing a lot of language like uh, these are suspects for COVID infection. Those are very strong language terms and we should try and avoid using those. And remember, 
remember these are people living with an illness as we all are as societies at the moment. So how do we find ourselves through this ethical and communication maze? And let's just look and see what kind of frameworks and guidelines we have to help us. It's important that these uh, guidelines are looked at in the context of planning and strategy. So whatever is there in your institution and your state, please be contributing to it. Uh, please know what are the, the different levels. I'm going to show you a slide with a Kerala outline. They will be different in different settings. But we need to know what they are. We need to know what is being uh, presumed for each level of the health and social system. We need to have clear communication structures and also protection systems, both for us in palliative care and in health care but also for our general population. I know that the, the district um, call centre in Arnakulam is having many, many people with fearful anxiety questions at the moment. We need to know how we can answer those. What are the testing and treatments? In the present con um, controversy today for the WHO, can I just publicly say how impressed I am with the guidelines and support that has come from the WHO, uh, from Dr Tedros and from everybody else involved, and these have been incredibly helpful for us as we plan. We also need to make sure we apply these triage and goals of care discussions in the context of holistic care and not separate to that and please let us support one another this is tough tough times particularly for staff members who may not um, have dealt with these conversations before or not in these kinds of numbers so i hope you can see this if it's difficult to read you have it in your ebook those of you who've come on since we started the call go and download your ebook now and have all these algorithms to hand and give us uh, feedback and discussion on what you think. I won't go through this in huge detail because I think for Kerala it's relatively well known. Um, if it's not, please, you have this algorithm to look at. But what this is trying to do is show the, the different stages of decision making and triage, which first of all happen with asymptomatic or mild symptoms, then go on to those with moderate symptoms and then, of course, this decision on whether we need to escalate for an intensive care setting. Uh, and that intensive setting may be um, for invasive or non-invasive ventilation, or it may be for intensive monitoring and high flow oxygen, which is becoming increasingly interesting, the use of CPAP and um, high flow oxygen rather than simply um, invasive ventilation. Can I also say that it's becoming more and more clear that this is not a typical ARDS picture, that this is a complicated uh, viral pneumonia, which is associated with severe hypoxemia. And uh, so I, I draw your attention to some of the clinical indicators in this particular uh, document that help us make those decisions. In Kerala, we have uh, a system whereby care can be managed at home or in a COVID centre escalated to a taluk hospital and further escalated on until an intensive care setting. But we have to be involved in some of those ethical decisions, particularly at that escalation to intensive care. There are many tools to help us with these conversations. We're going to look at the goals of care tool developed in Kerala. Uh, this is one I, I listened to from Scotland, which was a, a very nice, straightforward one. Let's try to have these conversations as early as possible. If you are looking after patients with comorbidities, chronic illness, please start having these conversations now so that when a decision around COVID happens, we have actually begun some of these conversations. So algorithm six, if you find that in your ebook or if you can try to see this on screen, uh, if you can't see it so well, I'm going to split it up over the next couple of slides. But what are our goals of care and how are we going to have those conversations? So let me go on to looking at this in two parts. This is a two page algorithm. OK, so you have it across two pages. It's algorithm six. If you click on the hyperlinks, you will find algorithm six. And thank you to Dr. Seema Rao and others for their work on this algorithm. So we have people who we have confirmed or suspected COVID. Remember, they're not suspected COVID patients. They're patients with 
suspected COVID infection. I just think it's important to remember that language. And we know some of the risk factors involved when we start to think about goals of care. We know that people who are younger with no comorbidities and mild symptoms are liable to do extremely well. And uh, figures across the world, as we're beginning to learn more about this disease, are showing extremely high survival rates, even if they may have um, moderate or even moderate to severe symptoms. We also know that those with comorbidities who are older, particularly each decade you get older, but I don't think it's just the biological age or rather the chronological age. It is the functional status and the severity of the symptoms that person is expecting. So let us be thinking about how people are before they get their COVID infection and making sure we have that conversation with family members and patients. We've talked about being prepared. We've talked about thinking through what options are going to be available, how we check the understanding how we start to discuss preferences. This is where autonomy comes in. Not everybody wants to know everything and not everybody wants to make the decision themselves, but we should create the space to have those conversations in an open and trusting and honest and skillful manner. We need to then make some decisions about what the patient would like to know and whether or not they would like us to deal with a health proxy. And then we have to look at the situation. It may be that we're giving a lot of reassurance that the person is relatively well, has low comorbidities, or it may be that we need to think of how we move to a conversation that is much more about uh, goals of care towards the end of life. And that is that last box. Now, when I look at it split up like here, you don't see the algorithm really nicely. So please look at it in one page. I'm just splitting it up so we can see mentions a couple of, uh, of other tools you can use. If you're not familiar with Breaking Bad News, the SPIKES tool can be helpful. It stands for S, setting up the interview, uh, A, assessing the patient, perception. Next, obtaining the invitation. What do you want to know? How much would you like to know? Only then do we start giving information and then addressing the responses with an empathetic way. And we've even given you sample ways in which you might ask those questions if you look at the page pages before. Tomorrow, Dr. Chitra will be taking us through uh, even more uh, discussions on how we address those psychosocial issues. Here we have some of these lovely questions. Um, we have the nurse protocol, which helps us express that empathy. You seem very angry. I can imagine how stressful or how anxious a time this is. These are all ways in which we can open the conversation up and express our empathy while we are listening with both ears as uh, we were hearing yesterday. And then also some ways in which to help us have conversations. Conversations which will lead us on to perhaps breaking bad news. Conversations which express our, our empathy and compassion. And conversation which give information. I just want to break off briefly and tell you that my neighbor's mother died a continent away the other day. And the two things she remembers amidst all the distress of not being there was a doctor who facilitated a four way WhatsApp conversation with her four siblings and her mother managed to speak two sentences to them and to wish them well. And secondly, the nurse who wrote an, an email with a paragraph talking about how much it had meant to look after her mother in her final days. Don't underestimate the power of your therapeutic self as you engage in these conversations. And please let us think of how we can use technology to really offer this kind of conversation, even if it means that our frontline team refer these goals of care back up to someone else. They may start the conversation, but perhaps those of us who are uh, more skilled in psychosocial conversations can be the backup for those kind of supports, particularly when people are distressed and choices are difficult. Okay, I want to make sure we have time for plenty of conversations. So this is our triage algorithm. Uh, this is designed for frontline healthcare workers, as I say. Some of you from ICU settings can contribute for your particular setting, but this is to help us know when we should be escalating care to the intensive care setting. 
or when we should be discussing why escalation is not in the best interest of that particular person and family. Uh, thank you, Shoba, for her work on this. It's algorithm five if you want to click on it in your ebooks. And I'm hoping by now you're going to tell me that all of you have an ebook downloaded. Okay, so at the top of the algorithm, we see patients with COVID-19 and no comorbidities, very straightforward. They continue with the agreed management protocol at institutional, state and national levels in your settings, and they continue with interventions. And there is evidence coming out day on day, including some very interesting trial work to try and help us make those decisions well. But here we go now down to the box where we're talking about here patients who have COVID-19 and comorbidities. How do we assess them? Now, we debated some time about which tools we should use to help us here. In an intensive care setting, we're often using multi-organ failure tools. In the UK, they're using a clinical frailty score, we'll show you. But we felt um, as a group that in frontline healthcare workers, they needed a tool that was straightforward and widely recognized. And so we suggested we looked at the WHO performance status and also we looked at the comorbidities and how they were contributing. So we're looking at the pre-morbid state. For example, the UK uh, frailty score, a score of five means someone who is at home and in bed most of the time needing help with most activities. And again, I'll show you the WHO scale in a moment and you'll see that it gives you similar ways. This is not a tick box, it's a tool to help you in those decisions. So if at the end of that uh, discussion, you are thinking this person is likely to benefit from uh, non-invasive or invasive ventilatory support, and although the aerosol risk is there, what I'm hearing is the CPAP designs are getting more uh, effective and more safe for healthcare workers. Then we do shift to a, a setting where a more intensive support can be offered, which might include high flow oxygen and might include uh, invasive and non-invasive ventilation. Of course, some people will improve from that and uh, be discharged, but we know that many, even those who are well at the start, are struggling if they are severe enough to be in respiratory failure and need ventilation. We also know that if your pre-morbid state is poor, then the chance of doing well from invasive ventilation is very poor. Not because invasive ventilation is not um, a good option from a ventilation point of view, simply that person has got multi-organ or multi-system disease and respiratory failure is part of an end of life complex rather than something which is easily reversible. Now, right in the center here, we see psychosocial support. And this really, we even try to design the triage so it is all around the outside. Let's at every stage make sure psychosocial support is there. Let's not try and avoid getting into battles with patients and families or with staff. Let's try and make these decisions in a consensus way. This is the bottom half of the algorithm. Again, I'm hoping you have this downloaded and you can see it. But if the treating team come to a conclusion or a consensus that further invasive or non-invasive ventilatory support is futile, then they should document that in the notes and communicate effectively to the family. Some places will have um, ethical framework documentation. There is some good evidence coming from colleagues elsewhere that if there is someone in charge of those triage settings who can act as a backup for these discussions, but not to be the primary clinician making the discussion decision, that's very helpful. And if you have an ethical committee that can be referred or be involved if there's some particularly difficult setting, that is also helpful. So we have three layers. Frontline, the triage team who can make those discussions. In some countries, that's a team of three, and they even call them the three wise men. I don't think they have to be men. <laughs> it's just a term but backed up by an ethical process within your institution or um, at uh, national level. If someone is not for invasive uh, ventilation, non-invasive, and they are extremely unwell and approaching respiratory failure, there is still a lot we can do and we must do. So please be very proactive about symptom control and holistic care. 
of course, symptom control will be needed at every stage. But here, let's particularly remember that symptom complex of air hunger and agitation and be very prompt at managing that. And if they are refractory, we may need to really be proactive about making sure that people have their end of life managed well. There was a young journalist who died in Zimbabwe at the first death that Zimbabwe had from COVID-19. And he wrote from the room, the, ice, the intensive care room where there was no ventilatory support, I am terrified. So let us not have our patients terrified. Let us make sure, even with all of our PPE and our distancing, that they still feel that someone is accompanying them, that we do our best to offer that holistic and psychosocial support with backup, and that we control the symptoms extremely well, particularly using opiates and benzodiazepines for this uh, end of life agitation and breathlessness complex. The guidelines are all there and the backup is uh, with you from your palliative care programs. These guidelines are in the algorithm at the bottom. I think we've talked about most of these. So they're there just to remind you about how we can make these discussions. And of course, we've already talked about refractory symptoms and end of life care. We have some specific guidelines also for you on end of life care. Here we have the WHO performance scale. I think you're familiar with this. You can read it as you go, but it moves from people who are able to do all activities without restriction. It's a functional scale right down to those who really are unable to do any self-care. Now in India, you know, we've had a discussion that people who are elderly may be able to do things, but their family might do it for them. So we have to make some uh, clinical judgments in here, but let's make them together and let's make them in a very transparent way. Okay, I want to just last few slides to pull this together. I've given you an example in the slides here of the frailty score that I mentioned earlier from the UK and the organ failure score that many ICUs use, but I won't go through that. We've talked through most of this communication, documentation, supervision, having someone that you can say, we've come to this consensus, can we check it with you? Ethical frameworks, holistic support, and no discrimination or abandonment. Let our patients know that they are equally valuable. They just may have different treatments that we are recommending. This is a very helpful document from the Royal College of Physicians in the UK in Edinburgh, which is written specifically for pandemics. It was written for 2009 flu pandemic and then adjusted, saying that we need to be accountable. We've talked about that. We need to be inclusive, include those who are affected by these decisions. Transparent. I know as, as, as medical staff, healthcare staff in India, there is a concern here, but let's be transparent. Let's be evidence-based using the right principles and let's be flexible. That's one of the key things we have to be as new infections emerge and as treatment options uh, and outcomes are, are increasingly evidence-based. And I want to finish with this. This is a very British sign, keep calm and carry on. But at the top is a comment actually from a medical student in Gaza, uh, where he talks about humanity until infinity is what he saw in palliative care. Let us make our ethical decisions, our ethical triage. Let us have our communication and goals of care underpinned by that sense of common humanity. We are in this together globally as well as those of us on this call and we stand together and I think this uh, pandemic is going to be a time where we see that common humanity in a way that we've perhaps never seen it before and I wish you well. I'm going to stop there with at least 25 minutes for debate and discussion. We can go back to any of the slides you would like to but I wanted to make sure there was plenty of opportunity to discuss more uh, and uh, I think Raji you and I are going to handle the con the questions. Dr. Sunil was not able to be on the call, so I'm very happy to, to answer questions and also add those to our colleagues. Please uh, put up your hand if you want to discuss. I see there's a lot of chat things already that I've not been able to look at while I've been presenting. Um, and just indicate to me if you would like to make a comment or ask a question. Thank you. Thank you, Moira, for the wonderful presentation. You have very well showed that your international expertise is well adapted to Indian settings. And thank you for being with us. Thank you very much. And now it is open to discussion. Uh, 
uh, Raji, uh, this is Chitra here. Yeah. And I just wanted to uh, just remind that I think Dr. Rajni Bhatt is there, a pulmonologist, and I think an intensivist also. And Dr. Naveen Jasmine from Trivandrum, who's also an intensivist. Uh, okay. It's good to also receive or hear from them uh, regarding, you know, what they feel about it because uh, they would be more frontline than palliative care physicians in this uh, in this uh, crisis. Of course, of course, they are welcome, Chitra. Thank you. Yeah, please. Sir, please. Please unmute yourself and please come forward with your comments. Can I maybe just get started with a question? Uh, this is Clara from Delhi, from the WHO Regional Office. Um, <clears throat> Thank you so much for uh, this very excellent and, and uh, comprehensive uh, presentation. I think it's an absolutely essential uh, tool, you know, the guidelines what Polyum has produced uh, to be spread and, and uh, trained uh, for training of uh, health professionals. Can I just ask that, uh, what is your experience that how far uh, countries were uh, the major peak, uh, you know, like in Europe or, or in Korea, have been able to rapidly upscale the training of um, of the uh, physicians caring for the COVID patients. Uh, maybe you can just uh, share some experience, or, or if you if you have good examples that how we could cascade this in a very rapid manner, while in our Southeast Asia region countries still we have only few cases. So this is now the time to uh, really prepare people. So if you, if you have any comment on that, that how we can reach uh, the health workers and, and if you have any good examples uh, from any of the countries where already had a large number of cases over. <clears throat> Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. That's a, an excellent point. I think uh, what I loved about the way Kerala and the team uh, uh, that we've worked on this is, is to try and develop these as early as possible ahead of uh, a huge patient load um, and to gain experience. So we spent quite a bit of time gleaning and looking through uh, and having uh, uh, discussions with colleagues from areas where the patient load was much, much higher. Um, I also was participating in webinars, particularly from the UK, from the Royal Colleges there, and internationally from the World Hospice and Palliative Care Alliance, where there have been quite a bit of evidence shared from other settings. So we used um, guidelines being produced in other settings as we wrote these ones. I think the only changes we really made was to make it applicable in a, in a lower resource setting, where there may not be the same access to medications and um, healthcare access. And in fact, Kerala, of course, has better healthcare access than some other places. So I would direct people to the, the resources being held by um, the Asian uh, Asia Pacific Hospice Network and um, by some of the excellent, I think really excellent document. I'm not just saying this because I'm British, but there was some very pragmatic, helpful uh, evidence coming from the UK. I was on a webinar the other night that had a pulmonologist, an intensive care physician, and a palliative care physician talking about triage. I think that's ideal. And those webinars are all free. So I'm seeing these are weekly educational opportunities being offered in some of these other settings, in, in particularly in Europe at the moment, which are heavily relying on experience and expertise coming from elsewhere. So my answer to you would be, what I'm seeing is they're using their existing platforms and um, particularly things like Royal Colleges or government uh, linkages to produce good guidelines and to roll those out and to enroll people in trials. To my knowledge, this is the first uh, comprehensive guideline, particularly focused on low and middle income settings. But many of the lessons are shared and some of our high income setting colleagues need to learn from us in low and middle income settings, particularly around the use of scarce resources. Thank you. Thank you so much. And if I can just ask if you can share some of the links to those existing webinars, I will be very happy to share it across the 11 Southeast Asia region countries, plus also with other regions. I'm sure that this will be appreciated in, 
in uh, uh, our Afro uh, office and, and Euro office and the uh, Eastern Mediterranean <laughs> office. So I will be happy to receive those for dissemination. Thank you. That's brilliant. And I'll get your contacts from um, uh, Dr. Rajkopal and the uh, colleagues in Pallium. Thank you. Okay. Now, Dr. Naveen and Dr. Rajni, but would you like to make some comments? It is actually good to know uh, about what Madam was talking, actually uh, regarding the ventilation part. So this is uh, as we see, as we have been seeing other experiences from Italy and US, the conventional ventilation part is not actually helping much. So maybe it's time that we should think about like accessory things like non-invasive ventilation and high flow nasal cannulas which are more of non-invasive things which we can use. So the ARDS criteria which we followed previously was not actually working well with the Italian population. So they were finding very difficult. So most of the patient who was not put on ventilator actually did well. That's what they could actually make out. So as much as possible, maybe we should avoid the invasive things. And as Madam showed in the chart, it's actually very good. Actually, it's the, 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 the algorithm prepared by Dr. Seema, which is actually very good. Actually, just uh, showing the systematic approach to go. And before going into the invasive part, it's worth looking at the, uh, the ethical aspect like uh, to discuss the level of support of for each and every patient so that we'll be able to fruitfully utilize the resources also. So these are the only two things I as of now from critical care point of view which is different from the other diseases or other ARDS patients whom we see. Um, if I may just... May I ask Dr. Naveen, I, may I ask you whether there's any particular tools that you use for scoring? just so that we understand how you are doing that assessment in your setting? Yes, actually there's no, uh, we actually, as per the Kerala government, we are having a, a clear cut guideline. So we actually categorize the patients into mild disease, moderate disease and severe disease. So most of the mild will be kept in a quarantine facility like a small hospital. And the moderate ones can be taken to a bigger setting. So in case they become severe, they will be, they can be transferred to the ICU. But what we yeah, have been seeing, thank you. Yeah. So what we have been seeing in Kerala is like we have been discussing with a lot of our colleagues. So most of the patients who become sick or become severe are not directly because of the COVID. So most of these patients were having multiple comorbidities like elderly population above the age of 70 a lot of cardiac issues uncontrolled diabetics more than covid these are the com the comorbidities have been pulling these patients down so patients with very poorly very poorly controlled health status poorly controlled diabetes, they have been doing pretty bad and patients are already having lung disease patients chronic smokers who have been uh, having copd or some of some kind of of the airway diseases. All well, these patients tend to do bad. So we can't blame put the blame entirely on the virus. It also it also yeah. depends on our pre-existing thing. Few exceptions are there. So if you look at Italy and US, of few of the young doctors who also got exposed was also not doing very well. So, uh, sure. so, so those are two exceptions. So we can't take things for granted. So we have to be very careful. So. To be on a safer yeah. side, better that's, to take it as a whole. Yeah. Thank um, you. And that's where the flexibility comes in. I think we had someone else answer, wanting to ask a question. Um, I just wanted to chip call? in with a few points about the pulmonary and critical care aspects of care. I'm, I'm Dr. Rajni Bhatt. I'm a pulmonary critical care uh, physician, uh, presently based out of Delhi. Um, so a few things that uh, there have been a lot of discussions um, with the Indian Chess Society hosting webinars pretty much every other day because the evidence has been pouring in thick and fast from across the world. Um, so all the professional organizations have been trying to pull in the uh, anecdotal experience along with the literature that's coming out to try and help us because we have not yet hit the peak in India. 
Um, I don't yes. think we are at a point where uh, our systems are overwhelmed, but I think uh, as was projected by the Indian Chess Society, we are likely to hit that point by the end of April or the early part of May. Um, keeping that in mind, I think uh, one of the points that Dr. Naveen Chasmin raised uh, earlier was, is, is extremely important, which is that since patients tend to decompensate faster and we know that the mortality on patients who require ventilation is much higher, we do need earlier discussion of goals of care. And that's something that um, even, you know, uh, primary critical care and emergency room physicians in the United States are saying that they're having to pick up the skills from their palliative care colleagues. So ER palliative care in the U.S. is picking up in a big way. We do not have as many professionals uh, trained in palliative care as we'd like. So this is the kind of thing that we, I mean, we're looking at maybe uh, doing training sessions for intensive care physicians and communication in, in this regard. Mm -hmm. So there's a group of us who are working on putting together webinars to train physicians in better ways of communication on goals of care early on in the management of a disease. The second thing that's coming up is how do we avert the conversion of moderate cases to severe cases? And this mm -hmm. is even, say for example, we have goals of care discussion and someone does not want um, intubation. They've made their wishes absolutely clear. Well, early awake proning is a way of averting that. And that's been emerging um, in Europe and in the United States as a way of averting um, intubation and tiding over a lot of people. So we have people in their saturations in their 70s and 80s. Um, and these are people who will be able to lie on their stomach for four hours at a stretch, two hours at a stretch, as much as is possible as is comfortable for the patient and we might be able to tide them over with that and avert the intubation. But I do think a very important thing is going to be trying to maintain communication between patients and their families. Yes. This has been very difficult for my colleagues who are taking care of patients in intensive care. The difficulties in, in facilitating conversations between critically ill patients um, and their families who are not able to meet them. Um, I've also been seeing that my colleagues are needing a lot of support in managing these patients. So the psychological trauma that intensivists are facing is a lot more, um, much more, and people are acknowledging it a lot more, which is a good thing. Dr. So, Rajani, I hope you're going Thank to you. be able to join us tomorrow uh, because uh, that, that particular issue will be dealt with. And I would like us all to just move into a new world where palliative care and intensive care work very closely together. Yes. I'm delighted to say here in Uganda, we train our uh, internal medicine physicians in both areas at the same time, the same module, and we work very closely. So let's try and, and learn things for the future. And the prone nursing is very important. We've had a question on the chat specifically about high flow oxygen and the risk of um, uh, my understanding from that is, and again others can comment, is that actually with good fitting masks, um, this issue is not as much of a concern as it was right in the very beginning. We were also hearing from our pulmonologists in the UK, there's a lot of thick, sticky secretions that are plugging. Uh, I don't know if anybody wants, I'm aware we just have 10 minutes or even less. So let's answer that specific question, if someone would like to, uh, about the oxygen, and then focus again on the triage questions and look forward to more psychosocial tomorrow. So where the high flow oxygen and the use of NIV and nebulizers is concerned, um, initially, we thought that the, the risk to healthcare workers would be too high, but we're realizing that there is a group of patients who require it. And as long as we are able to provide a good pr for a PPE to the healthcare workers, if we have negative pressure rooms, or um, there have been innovative solutions like using um, clear acrylic boxes or plastic tents that have been created to uh, decrease the exposure to the healthcare workers. So uh, for example, um, using uh, the kind of uh, tent or hood apparatus that you use for neonates, uh, there have been a lot of innovative, uh, um, you know, uh, 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 techniques that have been adopted. If you search on YouTube, there's a bunch of videos. Using a surgical mask over the nebulizer or the high flow nasal cannula will also reduce the amount of aerosolization that the healthcare worker is exposed to. Thank you so much. Thank you. Any final comments or questions? Dr. Gita, is your hand raised? Please. Ah, you're just saying nice things. Okay, thank you for the encouragement. Anyone with any last 
comments or uh, questions? Moira, uh, if I may, Moira, can you hear me? Of course. Uh, thank you. Uh, if I may come back to a question that Clara raised earlier, I, I wish uh, this could be addressed more day after tomorrow, but I'm still jumping in because I'm not sure that Clara can be with us day after tomorrow. Ah, okay. uh, when you, when we, Clara asked, so what are we going to do with all this knowledge, all the wisdom that Moira and others are sharing? How do we get it across to the COVID treating doctors in all these countries, which are all uh, in this region, Clara's region, it's all low middle income countries or low income countries. Uh, one major issue that I think we are going to face uh, is that um, when we do come to the peak, which now that the, which has the which has been prevented post, most probably by the lockdown, the peak has not happened. But the lockdown will have to be eased someday. So in May, when the lockdown is eased, we are likely to reach a peak, and that's when our intensive care units and isolation wards are likely to be flooded with patients who have respiratory failure. And we will be worrying about the machines. Can we use the newfangled machines, some of which are really laughable. Uh, what we now, right now, need to start thinking about is how to ease the suffering of those people. They all will need morphine. So they may need their benzodiazepine added. And these are things that are totally unfamiliar to a, a few intensivists, except some people like Regini. Most people are unfamiliar with it. And if, even if they are not familiar with it, they don't have access to it. This is an opportunity for us to take away a huge burden of suffering. Recognize whatever Moira said. See the ethical aspect. Do the triage. And when the chances of recovery are slim, at least, at least in those patients and for actually for everyone, let us attempt to relieve the suffering and let us concentrate on getting that organized. Unfortunately, even in Kerala, where uh, some of us have been talking about it in many fora, including a top experts forum, we have not been able to get our message across. Mostly because people want to be optimistic. They do not want to think about it. And uh, the and those who do think about it are seen as pessimists. So Clara, especially to Clara, I think in our region, all the 11 countries, we need to get this message across that people who are, are at the end of the triage, who are seen to have poor chance of uh, success of ventilation, at, and certainly during ventilation also, should have their suffering treated. They should, there should be this, this kind of online training more program widely available. This group attending this today is mostly comprised of palliative care physicians with only a sprinkling of others. We need to get this lesson across to COVID treating doctors far and wide. That will be the main re, uh, need. And maybe WHO CRO will be able to get the ear of the top people who take decisions. Our own cries in the wilderness are not heard. Clara's voice would be heard. Thank you. And may I just add to that very heartfelt cry that I've seen a um, comment on chat about the dilemmas yeah. for doctors. So there's a risk of something I would call moral injury here too, where people feel they're operating so out of their, their ethical frameworks that it's very hard to live with that. So let us also make sure we are supporting our staff in the process of this and, and making sure that we give some backup to these decisions. But we're delighted to have Dr. Clara here and um, we really look forward to your help to try and see how we can institutionalize and systematize some of the work that has been done. Moira, uh, I, I don't know if I am mistaken. I'm sorry. 
but i thought uh, to i mean this week's sessions are 75 minutes and due to end only at 4:15 if i am not mistaken we have more time yes uh, dr uh, raja can i just uh, comment uh, something because I, i'm i'm absolutely with you you know that i i i feel that it's absolutely essential you know to train our health reports and we are Uh, just have a little window of opportunity still to prepare people. One of the practical things that I would like to ask, and maybe our echo coordinators can also uh, help, that if the sessions this week are all recorded, uh, uh, like today's Moira session, if we can make a, a, a video, uh, which I can upload through the WHO website, and we can disseminate it to countries, so physicians can, uh, uh, even if they are not able to join, you know, in the next two weeks, uh, the courses what you are planning. Uh, would it be possible that that half an hour or 40 minutes uh, uh, presentation session, if we can put it online and share it with countries and share the video so they can watch it in their own time, I think that would be already a great help. In addition to the book, which I have already disseminated while we have been sitting here, I already sent it out to all our country offices and uh, also to our uh, headquarter colleagues in Geneva for dissemination. But I think these uh, presentations, uh, like today one, is excellent and it really kind of gets the key messages through. So uh, some people might be able to uh, uh, view them in their own time, even without attending the course. So uh, if you let me know if that would be possible, uh, then, then I would love to uh, get these and then we can um, uh, disseminate them to the countries. Uh, Clara, um, I, I, I am sure we can do it. We'll, um, Raju, please uh, get the permission of all the speakers and uh, we will share it uh, with Clara for the wider dissemination. Uh, Clara, I must also tell you, uh, Clara and everyone who is listening, that this ebook was created by a group of palliative care experts uh, led by many people who are uh, leading here, Chitra, Sunita, um, Raji. Uh, I'm sorry, the other problem in mentioning some names is that I'm sure I'll miss out uh, others, uh, certainly Moira and a few people, an informal group got together the amount of work that they did over 10 days was amazing. I wouldn't have thought that this was possible. And they came out with this. So uh, on behalf of everybody attending this and uh, every, from everyone in uh, CR countries uh, to that group, I must say profuse thanks. So I just wanted to say one uh, thing. I mean, if because the link of ebook has been given now in the chat, I want everyone to start using it, especially like Dr. Naveen and Dr. Rajni and Dr. Suma Balan from Amrita is here. So I, I hope that they start looking at it and if possible, share it with their colleagues and see whether it is useful in their settings so that we know we can get feedback and if we want to update or, you know, we want to add something, it will be really useful. So we need uh, feedback from other people who are not in palliative care also so that we can... Uh, really make some changes if it is necessary. So I really request everyone to start looking at it and be familiar with it and get back to us with feedback so that we know what we are missing and we can update. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you Chitra and thank you sir. We have a couple of questions and one question from Lipika. Should we encourage the family members to discuss advanced directive for DNR at the time of admission? So I think this term advanced directive is a tricky term. Some people quite like the term. It means a particular process. Should we encourage relatives to have advanced planning goals of care discussions? 100%. And we should support that. And it's a process rather than just a simple document. Because as we've already heard, the clinical situation will also determine what we do next. Um, but to encourage 
healthy conversations as actually part and parcel of living really is what we want to get to but particularly for those living with chronic disease about goals of care and expectations and if you are involved in chronic disease care to help facilitate those conversations I think is vital don't leave it to the intensivists to have to pick up all those problems when the situation is really very tricky and conditions may be deteriorating fast but do it sensitively UK has caused some controversy because somebody sent out letters to people to try and do this by letter. And that caused a lot of controversy. Maybe there can even be helplines um, set up through the government systems and, and uh, to, to deal with some of these advanced care planning discussions. That would be my strong suggestion. And intensive care colleagues, if you would like any of our help in training your staff, please do let us know as well. Okay, Madhira. I think that's the most appropriate answer. And closely related to the, the this particular question, there is another one from Dr. Divakaran, who is the Director of Institute of Palliative Care from Trishu. It is relatively easy for deciding not to ventilate a patient, considering the futility of that treatment. It would be morally challenging when we have to spare a person from the ventilation because of resource constraints. How are we going to resolve this moral question? Yeah, and, and that's what I was just alluding to before I, Dr. Uh, Rajkopal gave us the privilege of another 15 minutes that I had not <laughs> noticed. Um, I think that's this moral injury question that comes up whenever we're working in high pressure situations with uh, scarce resources. It's also there, to be honest, for our healthcare workers who don't have adequate PPE. And, you know, really one of the ethical issues, please, in this discussion is to advocate for effective PPE for our healthcare workers. And Dr. Devakaran, I think you are an expert and you may well want to give a comment yourself on that question. But I would say use your ethical frameworks. Um, principle of justice is the one that you're mentioning. But try not do it in general. Try not say everybody over the age of 60 will never be ventilated or everybody uh, with this problem will never be ventilated. Use those, those comorbidities and frameworks to help arrive at a consensus decision by the clinical team. Have some system of that consensus being checked, and um, that is by your triage coordinators or what's called in the UK, three wise men, and if need be, have an ethical framework. Don't feel the pressure, all of that is on the so shoulders of one person and then uh, really having to struggle to live with that. I don't know if you have any specific comment to make, Dr. Devaka. Okay, Madhra. Sir, Devaran, sir, would you like yeah. to comment? No, I am just talking about the moral issue because uh, to uh, not to ventilate a patient because of resource constraints is uh, uh, it's okay as per the uh, distributive justice the principle of distributed justice. But we cannot resolve the moral question, moral issue behind uh, the issue of not to ventilate a patient. That's the problem. Uh, it, it is ethically sound, but it's not morally uh, sound. That's the problem. So you've gone right back to the very first slide where you pointed out that these are these ethical principles are set within moral and cultural frameworks. In fact, they came from a moral values position but we do have to be quite careful how we apply them. And um, some people have said it should just be first come, first served. Others have said we should look at the benefits. What I think is really important is what we heard from Dr. Naveen, that we know the benefits are actually very, very, very little for some people. And so it's not simply about first come, first served, it's about who will benefit the most and how can we have that discussion in a moral and ethically sound way. Okay, thank you. Um, if I may, there is, uh, if I may just uh, speak about one paper which addresses this. So uh, I think Dr. Devanan Anantam, who is at Singapore and formerly uh, was in the UK, had actually written a paper about the uh, moral dilemmas about uh, resource scarcity. And this was around the time of the, uh, the influenza epidemic when it was H1N1. Um, I think I can try and find that and share with uh, the group because uh, that had some uh, really uh, uh, interesting discussions about all of these um, dilemmas that we face around distributive justice, first come first, uh, who deserves the resources more than another. So I'll, I'll see if I can find that paper and share it with everyone.
Thank you. That was a paper with, that it'd be nice for everybody to see that. That paper we did read as part of the preparations. And I, and I think that the things that helped us think it through were the principles, the issues of actually who's going to benefit, but also uh, not to take a totally utilitarian point of view. It's exactly. not just about the benefit to everybody. It's actually applying those to the individual person and family in front of you. Yeah. Thank you. And also regarding the, the question, like which all patients we should select to ventilate and which all we not. I think uh, the issue is not lying with the COVID as such. So whenever, whenever we come to a, a patient with a, any specific disease, whenever they require ventilation, I think we should look into that aspect also, like looking at the comorbidities. So usually, before this corona pandemic, so whenever a patient, such patient comes to the ER, so the first thing the ER physician looks at the patient, look at the whole history, everything, and they'll talk to the family regarding the issue. We'll tell them, we take our time and we talk to them and decide whether they really require the palliative care or will he really benefit from it. But now, uh, the difference has, as Dajo Obal structured very correctly, we are, now the scenario is a bit different. We are all in a tense situation. As soon as the patient comes in the emergency room, the, the first thing that comes to my mind is somehow push the patient to the ICU in a close place. So then we'll think, decide things a bit later. So that's the first change which we normally do because we're not spending the usual time which we usually used to spend with the family for such kind of a elderly population. And the second problem is because of the barricade, which we can for the PP and all the dresses and, 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 and methods used to conserve the PP, we hardly get one fifth of the time to spend with the family than we usually used to do. So regarding seriously speaking like lot of things which from the palliative aspect, which we used to do for other group of patients before this pandemic, are actually being lost now. Because I actually have my friend in Manjeri Medical College, they are actually treating a patient now on ventilator. Now the patient is like very old, like 87, 88 years, and actually he should not have been ventilated at, at all. But given that indent scenario none of the doctors were in a state to decide like how to talk whom to talk whom to call what are the ethical aspect will it be legally right be right so they are all really confused so as rajagopal sir has mentioned at the the palliative aspect of the treatment has to be rightly brought into the current practice right now or else it is going to be really difficult also right now the water palliative part which we used to follow till last month are being forgotten because of the scenario which we are following now that's what i could actually make out so we don't know like when to stop and when to talk to the family so all the principles whatever we learned are being have been kept aside at this point of time Yes, Dr. Naveen, it is quite challenging because, I mean, we cannot say, I mean, which patient can be saved with ventilation and which patient cannot be saved. And we are just listening to the stories about 97-year-old, uh, like, uh, people are getting uh, cured. And uh, it is quite challenging for the professionals to decide whether the patient has to be ventilated or not and whether they will be blamed later for not ventilating. So, you know, like, uh, the, the, the communication skills and the goals of care setting should be started very right from the beginning, I mean, as it was uh, highlighted in the presentation. Raji, can I add something? Raji, can I add something? Raji, can I add please. something? Yeah, please, please, yeah, please. So, yeah, this is, is that Shobha? Yeah. Oh, yeah, please, please come. Um, so, I agree with uh, Dr. Devakar and sir, uh, because there is going to be a a uh, total mor moral dilemma if the, the cases are going to escalate and we have to choose between patients to ventilate. Um, hopefully we won't get there. We're just hoping against hope. Um, but I think, like Moira said, the utilitarian principle wouldn't uh, work here because we really don't have time to discuss about benefit versus birth. 
and uh, also sit down and talk about the deontological view where people would insist come what may my father needs to be saved or my spouse needs to be saved which we would come across in uh, a normal palliative care setup when we decide about ventilating a patient this time um, availability is not there in these patients so it's really going to be you know uh, it's really going to be a traumatic experience if we are there as triage people helping the intensivists to decide and direct people away so that you know i don't think the intens intensivists will be able to take that burden on themselves they need to be teams created to do this and when the teams are trained it's going to be extremely difficult so in different places where palliative care is available it will be a little more easier but it's going to be a burden for the person who's uh, or the team that is involved but um, also there was uh, another uh, model uh, which is like you know it's going to rip your heart apart uh, but it's the, a tossing a coin like which australia uh, introduced with navin had put it in our group um, you know just tossing a coin to decide who goes on to the win later um, um, it is it is going to be terrible and hope uh, we don't come to that level but a lot of uh, communication can be done before uh, we actually think of ventilation so um, that we don't have that culture of actually talking about what is best or what are the things that is going to you know the outcome of this um, uh, a patient's uh, disease so that in, in in a particular scenario like covid it's going to be really uh, terrible to you know hold those kind of conversations but we need to try any other comments or questions sir would you like to add any final comments thank you raji uh, i was really thinking deeply about divagaran's question and uh, the day, as uh, navin said this is not only about covid in the intensive care setting and anywhere in medical practice we do come across these conflicts legal versus ethical ethics ethical versus moral and moral versus religious and so many things i think partly it's a question of we coming into acceptance that we are only human and we do not cannot be perfect and also uh, moira's three wise men thing uh, the clinician the person in that isolation ward physically exhausted mentally exhausted and worried about a hundred different things should not have to deal with that uh, ethical or moral question i think it is mandatory now considering the severity of the problem that all covid treating hospitals must have the three wise men that moira is talking about a committee which meets every day looks at the triage look set the realities and takes decisions on behalf of uh, on behalf of the whole team but i see that we are exceeding time uh, thank you very much for listening to me patiently back to you raji and back to you raju hi everyone uh, we already shared a link in your chat box for giving your valuable feedback and just click on the link and give your feedback and your feedback is extremely important to us please do it now within 2 minutes without any interruption it's a, it's a time request from our side and one more thing tomorrow we have sessions on psychological interventions in covid 19 the session will be carried out by dr chitra At the same time from 3 o'clock to 4:50 pm thank you Thank you and thank you Moira
for that wonderful presentation and bringing that three wise. Mara has ran out of charge, so she has left. So I'll.